this next panel on the new economic policy after COVID-19 and next generation EU. It is a great honor to be able to chair this panel also after such an inspiring speech by the commissioner and this very interesting high level dialogue on the EU recovery fund. Many thanks for that and also to the Brexit Institute and its entire team for putting together such an interesting conference for us. My name is Christina Neuhold and I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences at Maastricht University and I used to be the director of our UM campus Brussels and you can see this campus in the background and sorry that I look a bit like Harry Potter when I move but I wanted to to show you uh, the campus. Of course I'm like everybody else also uh, working from home but why am I mentioning the campus? When directing the campus, we put together this relay project and the relay project is financed under Erasmus Plus. And the um, rationale behind this project is to relate EU issues beyond the EU institutions to a wide array of stakeholders. And this panel is doing exactly this. So I'm very happy to be able to be here today. If we look at uh, the topic, a lot has been said already about next generation EU, and I would like to ask the panelists to be rather brief, so 10 minutes, but also to reflect on the issues that were just raised. So to what extent um, next generation EU has, has changed, is changing, and will change the EU architecture of economic governance, and its consequences for the future of the EU and its institutions. So what we just had, bef uh, just what was said before, to what extent um, will this actually be a game changer? Will this change politics and administration? So some reflections on this, but of course any other reflections as well would be very welcome. I would now like to briefly introduce the speakers and my apologies that I have to reduce this to just a few lines. First of all, we will have an introduction by Michael Breen, who's an associate professor at the School of Law and Government of DCU. His research is fo focused on the study of international political economy, particularly the politics of finance, the role of international organizations in the global economy and the International Monetary Fund. He's an external associate of the Center for the Study of Globalization and Regionalization at the University of Warwick. He's also a member of Transparency International's Expert Advisory Network. Professor Marie Mon, Ramon Marie Mon, who will follow Michael, is a professor in the Economics Department and Pierre Werner Chair of the European University Institute in Italy. He is on leave from and co-founder of Universitat Pompeo Fabra and Barcelona GSE and founder and former director of the Max Weber postdoctoral program at EUI. He is, among many other things, a member of the CPR Research and Policy Network on European Economic Architecture. He was Secretary of State for Science and Technology in the Spanish Ministry of Science and Technology in, 20, in 2000 until 2002. Then we have the honor to welcome Professor Vivian Schmidt, who is a Jean Monnet Professor of European Integration in the Frederick S. Pardee School of Global Studies at Boston University, as well as founding director of Boston University Center for the Study of Europe. Schmidt's research focuses on European political economy, institutions, and democracy. Her latest book also very nicely fits in with the topic of this panel, Europe, Europe's Crisis of Legitimacy, and focuses on the Eurozone crisis. She was recently named a Chevalier in the French Legion, Legion of Honor. And then last, but no, by no means least, we have Bart van Herke, who holds a PhD in social science and is the director, as well as a senior researcher at the Brussels-based European Social Observatory. His current research focuses on the European pillar of social rights and the social dimension of the new European economic governance, 
topics on which he has also worked as an associate academic staff member at the Research Institute for Work and Society, as well at as well as at the Center for Sociological Research at the University of Leuven. As you can see, we have very qualified speakers to kick off the discussion. One more housekeeping note, I would like to proceed as the previous panel. So please, after um, the interventions of the speakers, put your questions in the chat. You can address them to me or to everybody else or to the panelists or raise your hand and the DCU team will be so kind to unmute you. So without any further ado, Michael, the screen is yours. Good morning. Thank you very much for your generous introduction. I'm very happy to be here. It's an honor and a pleasure to talk to you all today alongside such distinguished speakers. Uh, before I begin, I would like to, to thank my DCU colleague, Federico Fabrini and the team at the Brexit Institute for organizing this very timely event. The last 12 months have been pivotal for the European Union. The European Central Bank's response through its asset purchasing program has prevented another sovereign debt crisis. And thanks to this program, countries can borrow at record low rates. Next Generation EU is another significant achievement in EU economic governance. When we look back at 2020, I think the EU can claim this as a significant victory. But this victory didn't come out of nowhere. The economic and financial crises of the last decade are at its foundation. And I think to understand the consequences of next generation EU, we need to think about its origins, as some of the previous speakers have already. So I'm going to highlight four developments, which I think are important for explaining why the EU has a new, albeit temporary, capacity in fiscal policy. First, Next Generation EU exists because policymakers and officials have learned from past crises. Before the global financial crisis of 2007 to 2009, there was an element of complacency that is not evident today. The EU policymaking community have more experience dealing with economic crises, as well as a greater understanding of the range of options available to address such events. Second, EU crisis architecture is much improved and this was described very well by our previous distinguished speakers. It's still incomplete in some important respects, but there is greater awareness of what is possible in economic governance. For example, the ECB's current pandemic scheme is similar to previous responses, and while next generation EU is a novel development, it builds on a decades-long discussion about the EU's lack of capacity in fiscal policy. Third, ideas matter. The idea of borrowing nearly 700 billion euros is not as radical today as it was in 2007 to 2009. Put simply, austerity no longer holds the same appeal as it did. And not because hearts have softened or EU member states have become more reckless. It's because intellectual authorities like the International Monetary Fund and others, have been producing analysis for over a decade that questions the effectiveness of fiscal consolidation in situations like this current pandemic. Fourth, and finally, as other speakers have noted as well, this was truly an exogenous shock. There is no disagreement who might be responsible this time. We are not dealing with a morality tale that looks for virtues and vices among EU member states. A pathogen is to blame for the current economic situation, and this fact provides a much stronger foundation for international cooperation and diplomacy. What would have happened had a global pandemic occurred in 2006? Would the EU have gained a new fiscal capacity? Would the ECB have taken such swift action? In this panel, we've been asked to give our views on how next generation EU has changed is changing the architecture of economic governance and its consequences. A more, I suppose, basic version of this question is, why did the international environment change? And is it likely to change again? And I think one of the inherent dangers in answering such a question is that every generation is tempted to believe that it is living at a time of unprecedented change. Looking at any specific interval of time, it's easy to exaggerate the level of change. And so it might lead us to call, you know, NGEUs, you know, 
Europe, Europe's Hamiltonian moment. But at a minimum, I think the EU can claim it's a significant political victory. And I'm going to outline four brief implications, potential implications for EU economic governance. First, NGEU has increased the power and authority of the EU Commission. And this should be seen as a welcome development, at least in economic crisis fighting. Central banks alone should not be the only entities responsible for fighting economic crises. Fiscal policy at the supranational level has an important role in responding, but has been neglected since 2009. Next Generation EU is a break with tradition and shows that international coordination is possible under these kind of challenging circumstances. Second, this is a temporary instrument. We shouldn't expect it to be like the ECB's asset schemes. There might be a significant interval or a very, very significant interval between this instrument and a successor. And yet, now that it exists, it is in the realm of the possible and provides a template for policymakers going forward. Third, next generation EU creatively links a number of elements, a green deal and a recovery package amongst others. These kind of linkages will give the package life after COVID. Policymakers and officials must find creative combinations like this in the future to unlock further iterations of these kind of schemes and capacities. Fourth and finally, despite being a positive and welcome development, next generation EU might not achieve its objectives and its overall successor failure will surely affect how EU economic governance develops in the coming years. As the distinguished chair noted in their opening address, um, the European Court of Auditors have warned that there is no guarantee that this will boost e growth or increase convergence between member states. Indeed, some indicators suggest that the pandemic has been disastrous for some member states. The economic damage in countries like Spain, Italy and Greece will become more apparent as restrictions are lifted and vaccination rates increase. But I will give you a few headline figures. According to the OECD in 2020, euro area gross domestic product fell by 7.6%. This stands in comparison to 3.5% in the United States. Gross fixed capital formation fell by more than 10% compared with just 1.7% in the United States. And worryingly, there has been a large drop in private investment, much more so than the recovery measures in next generation EU. And of course, these declines and the economic hit has been concentrated in Southern Europe, which has already, already been struggling with severe problems. So there is a significant risk of an asymmetric recovery in Europe, where some emerge relatively intact while others take longer to recover. There are a range of different scenarios from mild to severe. An optimist would see recovery in most parts of Europe soon. A pessimist would see poor performance in Southern Europe. EU economic governance must be prepared to adapt in these worst case scenarios with innovations. And just to conclude, and partially in response to some of the previous uh, comments at the, at the last high level discussion, um, we should think about the role of conditionality and where it should enter into, our pro into these programs. Looking back at the IMF and its history of conditionality, I would agree with our distinguished speaker that it was very much, a, uh, it has caused them trouble in an Asian context. And something that they learned from past crises is that you can't expect too much from conditionality. You can't impose too many conditions because you risk undermining everything. So any conditions need to be highly selective. And indeed, um, in some cases, conditionality will not at all be appropriate. And I would very much agree that greater accountability and transparency measures can be used instead. Um, thank you very much for your time. I look forward to the discussion. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Michael, for this very inspiring uh, kickoff for this discussion and also showing us the different nuances and also the different sides of the coin. On the one hand, uh, change has already happened, but the proof of the pudding is also of obviously uh, in the eating. 
we do not only have a very high level panel, we also have very high level audience. And I was just informed that the former prime minister of Ireland, Bertie O'Hearn, also joined us, so welcome. I would now like to give the screen to Professor Ramon Marimon. Thank you, Christine, and thanks, Federico, for the organization and inviting. Uh, I will share some slides and I will try to be fast. Uh, and it's following up pretty much the discussion we had. I will center on five plus two after Brexit and COVID challenges. The first one is the fact that now we are not at the, a year ago in the first way, but we are already thinking like in the fourth one. And therefore, the situation afterwards is going to be difficult in many countries, as just now it was being remarked about the situation in the southern areas. That will make, a ch we need a change of emphasis from the first aspect, which has been more like Keynesian in the sense of increasing demand and support and so on, to make sure that all the markets work, that this innovation takes place, that the financial markets work. So that's an aspect of more competition policy, more other policies, but this is important that's going to take place. That the single market really recovers as a single market, which now after this one more year, more than one year, being separated in countries and regions has been very unhealthy. But this also has an institutional aspect which is exactly this. I mean, some reforms have been done as we remarked during the crisis, the Euro crisis, but some of these things just stop after that, like banking union and capital market unions. Those things need to be pushed forward. We have a huge level of debt and this is gonna be much, much higher. Even the forecasts that are being done now, maybe not enough, given that the crisis has been so long. So that's something that is a challenge to which we now have, and this is very good, well, welcome, as it's been said, the possibility of going up to almost 8% of the EU GDP in euro bonds, different forms. And that's something that we might have other uh, forms to be paid uh, at the European level, taxes, but that's something new. It's not huge but that's something that will need to be dealt properly. We are much more interdependent now, but we are also more divided. This is the history of the 21st century of crisis in Europe. If we normalize it in 2008, we all the same. Before, we're not that different. And this I divided the euro area between Jeeps, Greece, Italy, Portugal, and Spain, and the non jeeps ones have gone up already more than 10% and others down on a 10%. Of course, the diversion is much broader if we look at more carefully in the case of Greece, it's very worrisome. But still, Portugal, Spain have not even recovered and Italy is worse than it was at the beginning of the century. Of course, we have a good exception and here, you guys in Ireland, we are the exception. But this also will create issues about how we deal with a serious issue, which is in fiscal policy, to have counter-cyclical fiscal policies. And now we have the escape clause, and it wasn't just announced that it now is extended to 2022, which is a welcome thing. We don't want to have the problem right now, but eventually you will have to deal with it and find new ways to establish coordination of fiscal policies to make sure that they're more counter-cyclical as they are, that we, there is, will be a pressure to keep the spending more, on, but that's gonna have to be done at the right time. And as it's been said, now the EU has many more responsibilities than we had before. I will call the public goods at the European level are much more understood. And therefore it takes more of a role, the commission and the whole EU and health security, digital security, migration, the international stand is much more important now. So all these things require that we have really, yes, uh, national reforms in many countries, particularly in the chips, they're still done. They are now connected to the program and we can discuss more about this conditionality afterwards. 
But we also, as I said, we should have new, different, more minimal, I will say, more carrot based instead of punish or stick based fiscal rules. We should have resharing, not just for severe crisis. And that what becomes like later on more cohesive to even. We should be able to have these common policies, although we are very different. This idea that we have the union and then therefore we converge and then we can do all things together equally, no. And we saw that scrap that, that there will be differences. We do strengthen the fiscal capacity of the union at the union level itself. You have to take all the responsibilities as we have now seen. I mean, take care of the vaccines. They should be able to do it properly, which means also we should lessen the burden of the ECB. And as such has been said. Too much uh, has been excellent, the job has been doing, but it's maybe too much on its third. Which I think we come to the thing that is probably more crucial on how it's done is how we gonna efficiently deal with all the EU and Euro area debt. This takes in particular that what I think we need is to an integrated fiscal institution. There should be institutional development out of that, and I think that's the most important. In the US, the Federal Reserve Bank deals and coordinates with the Treasury, and the Treasury has been extremely active in all this crisis, and it is now. Now it is the role of, in part of the European Commission and in part of the ESM. Those things need to be put together much better than we have. And it's very important that this institution has some degree of independence in the same way that ECB has, for one simple reason is that that's a way to make it more credible when you make programs, when you have conditionality. That sustainability analysis is gonna be a crucial element. And that takes us to two more things. Now we have low interest rates. I believe when you do the, interest, the real interest rate minus the growth rate, all these countries except for Italy, we have been in the negative. So it means, well, it's cheap. So it's not the worrisome. But that's uh, a blessing, but it's also a curse in two dimensions. One, because of course, looking way, way ahead, it might not be like this all the time. The other is because one of the reasons that might be behind this is a demographical change. And then on demographical change, well, we know when a possible next crisis will be perfectly well. It's not COVID. We know exactly in the next decades, in most European economies, what the so-called dependency ratio between people over 65 and people in the working age is gonna double. This means a huge potential crisis in particularly the countries that have a pay-as-you-go system. I've been working, for example, in the case of Spain, if I put this in the computer and to make it sustainable means increasing the payroll tax from 25% to 50%. That's extreme burden in an economy. I could do it differently, of course. It's just cut the, the benefits by 50%. That will be a huge riot. We know that this crisis, when it's gonna happen. So it means that when we do uh, look at what we do now, we should look ahead and take that into account too. So as has been said by the commissioner, next generation EU, I think too will be a turning point, but then it can be a joint liability too, or a joint asset. And if it's joint asset, because we're going to have a more efficient monetary, fiscal, and financial union with the indigenous countries, a more federal one, if you want to call it like that. Thank you. Thank you so much for this very profound economic analysis and also calling uh, the attention for an integrated fiscal uh, institution. I would now like to give the screen to Professor Vivian Schmidt. Thank you. So um, I'm delighted to be here and thanks to DCU and Federico for arranging the event. So next generation EU is a major achievement. Previous speakers have talked about what this is and how much it represents a major leap forward based on new economic ideas, based on its economic impact, but also we've got 
accounts of the problematic impact and possible differentials between North and South. So I'm going to move, shift a little bit away from the economic issues to ask how EU's economic governance can be reformed so as to ensure that the EU moves beyond the COVID-19 pandemic effectively and democratically toward more sustainable growth and prosperity for all Europeans. So as part of this, it's clear that we cannot and should go back and should not go back to the status quo ante of the Eurozone, focused on rules-based governance with limited common EU instruments for investment in the future. Instead, to ensure the greatest possible success in the future, the EU needs more instruments to promote EU-wide sustainable development in a context of more flexible economic governance that is also more democratic. So for the instruments, my sense is that the EU needs to build on the pandemic next generation EU response, making it permanent and bigger. As for the governance, the EU Eurozone needs to develop more decentralized processes with fiscal guidelines and macroeconomic dialogues that could allow for differentiated member state targets. I'll explain all of this in a minute. But the process also needs to become more democratic with greater participation by the social partners and the citizens along with the parliaments. So I probably don't need to remind everyone how far we've come in such a short time. There have been major changes in the EU since February 2020 when we were all living with the aftermath of the Eurozone crisis. In the Eurozone crisis, remember, instead of providing some form of debt forgiveness and instituting mutual risk sharing instruments necessary for any fixed currency zone to work, the EU reinforced the rules of the Stability and Growth Pact by mandating austerity and structural reform policies overseen through the European semester. The Eurozone came to be characterized by the subtitle of my book by governing by rules and ruling by numbers with the wrong rules and numbers, which didn't work. This was not just a problem of economics or politics, this is a crisis of legitimacy. With the procedural parts of it, there were problems of accountability, transparency, inclusiveness, and openness. Performance economies deteriorated in many parts of Europe, and the politics, as we saw, became increasingly toxic at the national level with the rise of populist anti-system parties and at the EU level, with increasing politicization going from the bottom up into the council from the among the member states, but also at the top among different institutional actors, council commission in the European Parliament. But fortunately, as the crisis slowed, EU actors themselves increasingly eased the application of the rules with a more flexible EU governance. governance. The Commission in particular moved from enforcer of the fiscal rules to a moderator of the rules. But, and this is really in response to some of the discussion in the high level panel just preceding us, but even though Eurozone, the Eurozone ec economy sub subsequently improved, the suboptimal rules remained. And in particular, the European semester was perceived as top-down and hierarchical. Arguably, in Northern Europe, it was seen simply as a technocratic exercise. Um, but certainly elsewhere, it was not simply seen as paternalistic, but as oppressive in the periphery, especially conditionality in the program countries. And of course, more generally, the Eurozone continued to suffer from too little investment and low growth, rising inequality and poverty, and persistent macroeconomic divergence among countries. And then the COVID-19 pandemic hit with the rolling close downs of national economies. And that response actually present, represents, to my mind, a new beginning. But of course, if we remember what happened initially, this initially it appeared like the Eurozone déjà vu all over again. Um, member states pursued their own policies. They violated the Stability and Growth Pact on deficits, and thank goodness they did, ending budgetary austerity with big infusions. Um, they also violated the Schengen rules, 
So this looked initially as migration crisis redux. The council seemed unaccountable. It failed to act. The frugal four was against any kinds of grants. Germany initially, remember, demurred. Italy was desperate and disillusioned. The ECB claimed it was not its mandate to deal with the spread between German and Italian bonds, but fortunately reversed itself immediately thereafter and launched the um, PEPP, the Pandemic Emergency Purchasing Program. And of course, in this initial period, the commission was nowhere. It had little governing authority, no mandate on health, limited fiscal capacity, but, and the European Parliament seemed to play almost no role. However, things changed very, very quickly. The council, um, after this initial lack of accountability, let's call it. The Franco-German duo was back by May 2020 with a proposal for 500 billion in loans. And this breaks the taboo against EU level debt. The frugal four is against, but it can't stop it. Although it does reduce the generation, generosity of the final deal. And of course there was the rule of law controversy, which remains a tremendous problem. Um, as Poland and Hungary put spokes in the wheels for the final budgetary agreement. But nonetheless, things move forward. There was a final agreement. Um, and the ECB reverses all of its previous um, policies. It actually goes beyond its cute quantitative easing program before and buys bonds without limits. Commission becomes ministers of moderation, suspending the deficit and debt rules you know, invoking the escape clause, suspends the state aid rules, creates sure on unemployment, proposes a bigger EU recovery fund, if you remember, beyond the Franco-German duo, um, EU for health. And of course the EP really comes forward in the budgetary negotiations as a robust actor. So if we look into EU Eurozone governance, particularly industrial policy Euro European semester, we can see a major shift in the role of the commission. Now it has serious money to control and disperse via its own resources raised on the markets and a bigger budget via the multi-annual financial framework. It has new tasks, um, industrial policy tasks with its focus on allocating the resilience and recovery fund for the green transition and transition and digital transformation. Um, and of course it's overseeing this dispersal in response to national um, resilient and recovery fund plans. As such, the commission has moved from an enforcer of the fiscal rules or even a moderator of the rules, as I mentioned before, between 2013 to 2020, to perhaps a promoter of industrial policy arguably without attention to the rules. Our major question, before I go on to suggest some where we should go forward, is, is this just a hiatus? And other speakers already raised this, both in this panel and the previous one. Is this simply a hiatus after which things go back to normal, status quo ante? Are we back to Northern European countries' preferences? Um, and a, a kind of major, we've already saw problems with the response to the previous, to the Eurozone crisis, is that we see a major imbalance in the Eurozone. The Northern Europe had its own resources to fight the pandemic and reinvigorate uh, their own national economies. Um, you know, if you just look at the size of the German fiscal stimulus that was proposed, it was almost half the total of all of the stimuli. Um, compared to what others spent, you know, com certainly compared to Italy, Spain, Greece, etc. Uh, so one, do we go back to Northern European countries' preferences, which would be deficit and debt rules? What happens when the escape clause is pulled back? Will the austerity hawks come back with a vengeance, now pointing to such high levels of debt and debt, deficit and debt? Um, will we go back to the commission as enforcer of the deficit and debt rules if they're left unchanged? Um, or don't we need to reform or even abandon those rules? We'll talk about that in a minute. But of course, that's not easy, given that the rules and numbers are all deeply embedded in all aspects of the treaties and legislation. Um, we heard already, you know, what happens with regard to the German Constitutional Court? 
Um, and, you know, and I guess in the end, um, will this fund become permanent? Our, the sort of RRF, the next generation EU, will it become a permanent fund or is it doomed to be temporary? And of course, I suppose much of this is contingent on the success of, of what happens with the, um, in, in the member states. How fast will the rollout of the resilience um, uh, and recovery fund be in the different countries? Will it be done efficiently, accountably, without corruption throughout? Effectively in terms of performance? Will it rescue, not simply rescue Southern Europe economies, but make them grow again so that they can grow their way out of debt? Will it be done democratically with wide national consultation? Or will it be simply another technocratic fisk, fix? So here are my proposals or my hope that this, how we can move forward. First, um, as I just mentioned, the Resilience and Recovery Fund is temporary. We need a permanent fund with a serious EU budget. More EU own resources to fund the green transition and digital transformation, as well as to address inequalities. Um, we need to think of this, of this maybe as sovereign wealth funds to invest as grants to member states in education, training, income support, as well as investment in greening the economy and digitally connecting people. Beyond this, what about the European semester? Um, do we permanently suspend or at least reform the Eurozone debt and deficit rules? There are actually lots of ideas about there and a big discussion going on. How about abandoning the fiscal rules for fiscal standards or guidelines? A proposal by Olivier Blanchard. What a, the golden rule for public investment in growth enhancing areas so that it doesn't count against your debt? and deficit, if you're investing in education and training, greening the economy and society, digitally uh, enhancing the infrastructure. Um, and another possibility would simply ignore the size of the public debt entirely. So long as a government can borrow at rates lower than the average rate of GDP, it shouldn't be a problem. And I know this is going to be controversial, especially amongst Europeans, but what about eliminating the debt break from the national, from national constitutional legislation? You know, that was part of the fiscal compact, but that has been a serious problem for investment, not just at uh, the national level, but also at local levels. Um, what about rethinking the European semester procedures themselves, not just the rules, but the procedures. Instead of the macroeconomic imbalance procedure, which was actually 28 different state-specific procedures, how about instituting a macroeconomic dialogue in which one can decide, depending upon where a country is in its, in, in its economic cycle, providing different targets for the member states. And of course, as part of this, one would need also to decentralize and democratize the European semester, make it more bottom up than top down. And actually it is already more bottom up as a result of this shift and the focus on national recovery and resilience um, plans. Um, but one should also officially change the nature of the evaluations, turn the fiscal boards into industrial policy advisors, turn the competitiveness councils into industrial policy councils, but also and importantly this, democratize the whole process, ensuring that the social partners and civil society are really strong actors in the process. Um, and what about national parliaments? Bring national parliaments into these national processes of these national re um, re re resilience and recovery plans. And of course, there needs to be more European parliamentary involvement in the European semester. You know, possibly one should move to co-decision on the European semester, but certainly also link this to the social dialogues in the European pillar of social rights. So now I think I need to conclude what next, you know, we still have some way to go. The populist result, sorry, the populist revolt is not over. Governing by rules and ruling by numbers of the Eurozone have only been suspended, not officially revoked. Watch out for the Austerians. The frugal four plus are likely to come back. 
2023, 2024, we don't know, two to three years. Um, and of course, the Eurozone still lacks the necessary instruments to ensure optimal performance. But at least the COVID-19 response reverses some of the worst lapses of the Eurozone. Thank you. Thank you so much for this, uh, really a tour de, de force. You were able to look back ahead and come up with pretty revolutionary proposals. And I, I hope that this will engender a nice discussion. I would now like to give the screen to Bart van Herke. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, Christine, you hear me properly, right? Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you, Federico and your institute for organizing this uh, this important um, event. It's really a, a privilege for me to be here on screen. And of course, a pleasure to be in the company of the former prime minister. This is, uh, this is really, this is really great. So what I would like to do in the more or less 10 minutes that I have, and Christine, don't hesitate to remind me when time's almost up, uh, is basically provide uh, first, um, a rather optimistic reading of what is happening, what has happened with regard to uh, NGU and the recovery fund, drawing also on the on the book that we just published at the European Social Observatory on uh, social policy in the EU. And where I would like to briefly focus on three, three notions, innovation, uh, solidarity and uh, vision. And then I'd like to uh, put on the floor a bit of more prudence, a, a little bit more pessimistic reading, uh, possibly building on what uh, Vivian has just uh, explained this uh, with so much uh, vigor. So first of all, um, innovation, solidarity, vision. Yeah, innovation, I think a lot has already been said. I don't need to repeat what the previous speakers has, have said so well. I think Alex uh, made it uh, very clear in a convincing way that this recovery fund is in, indeed in many ways quite a new animal and I don't think we uh, uh, it's 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 entirely clear yet to what extent it is uh, it is new but I think it is including um, in the um, with regard to the the fact that the European Commission will find itself uh, in a very different role in this uh, recovery fund uh, it will be directly involved in steering uh, national policy choices, uh, which is a, a new and, uh, or to a large extent new, because it goes much further than what we have known in the European semester, and indeed a very tricky experiment in terms of um, governance. Uh, it will uh, have to have a say and uh, give green light or orange light or maybe red light with regard to very sensitive um, uh, national policy issues, including in the social field and labor market policies. Um, and so this is really, um, yes, in terms of innovation, a uh, very, very important point, especially because the commission, um, whose role has been really uh, enhanced, it has been said by several speakers, uh, will not really be able to, to be accountable if things go wrong, and at the same time also won't be able to uh, take the credits uh, if things go well. So this is a very interesting and important uh, policy experience, uh, experience uh, and I think that there is a risk of a backlash uh, in this context uh, with regard to this enhanced role of um, the European Commission. And indeed, the big question, as Vivian rightly put it, whether it will be uh, possible um, to come back to normal as a situation as we knew it before. Second point, solidarity. Um, I think a lot has been said about it um, already. Um, I think indeed uh, what uh, what this NGU suggests at least that, that, that there is a new sense of, of solidarity uh, at the uh, at the EU level, not in any romantic uh, in a in a romantic fashion or an idealist sense, but in a in sense of mutual responsibility among member states, uh, which wasn't e uh, evident, as Vivian very nicely uh, explained, uh, uh, and the indeed the initial reactions at the onset of the uh, pandemic let us uh, fear the worst but then things changed um, very quickly. 
Um, and I, I agree with what Michael said, huh, that there has indeed been quite a lot of uh, learning going on. There has been uh, policy learning with regard to the, the, the financial and e economic uh, crisis, not to repeat the memorandums of uh, misunderstanding, as Thomas called them, or the, br the brutal uh, austerity measures to which uh, Vivian um, uh, referred to. So solidarity. Third notion, vision. I think it's fair to say, and normally uh, we are not so generous with regard to uh, towards the European Commission when we do our analysis at the, at the European Social Observatory. Uh, I think it's fair to say that the new European Commission, the von der Leyen um, Commission, uh, has been very ambitious uh, from, from the onset, including with regard to uh, the Green Deal which to the surprise of many observers, I think, has actually been very strongly reinforced through the Recovery and Resilience Fund. I would say more, uh, without the RRF, uh, without NGU, uh, the Green Deal may in fact have been limited to a new vision on things. And I think that with it and the link between the, uh, the, the Green Deal and the RRF, it now really has the potential of uh, creating a U-turn with regard to EU and national policies, uh, in, in not only in the environmental area, but also with regard to the, the digital dimension. So I think here, um, to some extent, um, uh, uh, COVID-19 created um, uh, a window of opportunity, if it is uh, even possible to say that with regard to this uh, tremendous or terrible um, situation. So the RF is indeed a milestone if well uh, implemented. And this brings me to my second, less optimistic, uh, more prudent, uh, more prudent uh, point that I want to make. Namely, um, well, of course, as we all know, huh, the, the, the RF will be a, a success if the money in the end is well spent. And this is a very, very big question mark on the table now. Um, Thomas also referred to that in his uh, very nice intervention. What we see, uh, I think, and let's discuss, maybe uh, other people have a, a different view on this. It seems that uh, all parties concerned, the member states, uh, the European C Commission are uh, very keen on, uh, to some extent, rushing things through which is completely understandable, of course, in view of the situation and in view of the stakes that are out there. Um, all parties, of course, involved eh, would like to get the money flowing as soon as possible, and there is already some delay. Um, and at the same time, of course, we know that identifying quick and good investments and reforms uh, may turn out to be a futile exercise. And uh, Barack Obama has, uh, has done some very interesting declarations after one or two years of uh, his experience uh, in the United States. So what we see is that the European semester has been considerably lightened up in the, in the months after, or in the weeks even, in, uh, after the, the, the RF was, was introduced. Uh, the management of the European semester has been centralized uh, at the level of the SecGen of the European Commission, namely in this uh, recovery task force, uh, of course, in close um, collaboration with DG, the new DG reform and DG ECFIN. There is the central role of the Economic and Finance Committee. Uh, by contrast, it's quite clear that some of the key actors who were by the, um, uh, in the end an important role in the European semester have been largely uh, sidelined in this uh, whole new uh, endeavor. Uh, and I think we should problematize this and this is linked of course to the point that uh, Vivian was making uh, so vividly before. So I, th I think it's quite clear in fact that indeed that the social affairs players um, that were, uh, that had an important role in the European semester, have partially lost the space that they slowly but certainly acquired in the semester. We have referred to this as the socialization of the European semester. And this refers to uh, the increasingly strong role of ministers for employment and social affairs, the DG employment of the European Commission, social partners, NGOs, to which uh, Vivian also 
uh, referred. So they have been largely sidelined in this new um, uh, exercise. I think this is really problematic. So I don't want to be optimistic at, about this at all. Uh, I think um, one of the things the pandemic did was to bring to the fore huge gaps in our social protection systems. Um, we feel as Europeans, of course, that we have much better systems than Americans or than the United States or let alone other parts in the world. And at the same time, we should be very modest because we have seen in all uh, countries, including the most affluent European countries, major gaps in social protection, especially for women, especially for migrants, especially also for youth, etc. And so it is quite clear to me that the absence of some of the core uh, social affairs players, especially in this, uh, in the economic situation um, that we are in, and Ramon has uh, rightly pointed out to the major uh, issue that is going to be out there with regard to pensions, but there are other um, issues that, that are going to be on the table. I think uh, excluding or sidelining uh, the social affairs players in the RRF is really a problematic issue. I don't say that for philosophical reasons or political reasons. I think it's a matter also of expertise. And here I would like to maybe disagree a little bit with what Alex said, even though he said many things that I really sympathize with. I'm not sure this best friend advice, uh, as he called it so nicely, will do actually. Um, I don't think the European Commission is really in a position uh, to give the best possible advice uh, to the member states. I think the, the, Europe, the member states and the European Commission, uh, before that matter, have constructed over the past 10 years a very dynamic and a very powerful system of multilateral surveillance between the member states and the Commission, where a lot of learning is going on, where a lot of good practices are being discussed. And the move that we see now within the RF to more bilateral negotiations between the Commission and the Member States, I think is really a uh, big loss and doesn't help with regard to the question of how the money should be spent um, well. And of course, I don't even mention with regard to sidelining uh, the minimalistic role that is played by the European Parliament, as indeed, as was indeed the case already due, uh, during the past European um, uh, semester. And I fully uh, endorse this idea uh, of moving to uh, co-decision if possible at all. So I want to wrap it up here. I'm, I'm at the end of my time, of my 10 minutes timeline, Christine. So all in all, uh, an optimistic reading of the start of this RF and NGO, innovation, solidarity, vision were clearly on the table. And this was, this is an enormous step forward. This was not um, uh, really expected. And at the same time, with regard to the actual implementation and how this will uh, uh, be taken forward. I think we should re be really prudent and I am a little bit uh, pessimistic because I really feel that um, excluding some of the key actors around the table from uh, this exercise really creates uh, big risks in terms of democratic ac accountability but also in terms of good implementation and spending the money well. Thank you Christine. Thank you so much for this very interesting intervention, again, very differentiated and also bringing the, the role of the social partners uh, to the fore and shedding light on the need for more accountability. I would now like to open the debate. And as I said before, you can put your questions in the chat or indicate that you would like to take uh, the floor and the DCU team will unmute you. I would also like to say that I would like to collect questions because we have several uh, speakers as opposed to the first panel. So could you please also indicate to whom you are addressing uh, the question? Of course, you can also address the question to several speakers because the um, interventions were very, very nicely uh, interlinked. I would also like to thank everybody for sticking to the time. I did not have to intervene and anyway it was so interesting that I was not looking at my watch. So I would now like to open the screens I um, and I also take questions in the chat as I've just said. And maybe the team can also help me if you see someone, because of course I don't have the overview. Um, there is a question by Michelle Chang. Um, 
And here she says in Ramon Marion's presentation, he noted that eventually the escape clause of... Excuse me? Uh, Christine, if you want, we can give the floor to Michelle, if that's easier. I would love to do that. Yeah, Please, Michelle, take the floor. Okay, hello everyone, and thank you very much for your interesting presentations. I wanted to ask uh, for a little bit more detail on Ramon Marimont's presentation, in which he noted that eventually the escape clause of the Stability and Growth Pact would need to be disactivated. And you didn't go into a lot of detail, you asked a few questions, and I wanted to know if you think it needs to be disactivated for procedural reasons, because of course they won't let this go on forever, or because of economic necessity, that we have to reinstate the rules to avoid problems later. And do you have any reaction to Vivian Schmidt's remarks that were considerably more critical and skeptical of the rules regarding fiscal coordination? Thank you. The fact is that uh, a serious problem that has come out these years, and it come out during the, to uh, the whole 21st century, is the inability of advanced economies on following countercyclical fiscal policies. In a sense that, in the case I'm from Spain, when I live in Italy, those countries we had a good party before the Euro crisis, and because interest rates were low, something that we could not afford before, but now we were in the union. And then we're not able to save enough for all these dual reforms enough in that period. And the counterpart, then we had to do all this austerity. I absolutely agree with the criticism of austerity imposed, but this doesn't mean that then we should just go on again and do the same thing when times get better. So some form of coordination is important. I don't believe in rules that say that then you're going to punish a country with the 2% or the GDP or something, okay. And the process of being more flexible has made also the rules completely cumbersome. I mean, now there are so many ifs and thens and it's just, no. And I, I am very sympathetic to have, A, it needed just very simple rules on and taking into account that yes, uh, I mean, sometimes you need to borrow to do some reform or to uh, do some investments which are important. You should be able to be able to do that. But more importantly, and I think we have a huge instrument to use now, is that you should have the carrot more than the stick. And the carrot now is the higher capacity to have European debt, for example. Okay. And which is take us to an issue that came in the previous panel about conditionality. Too much has been done on like doing ex well, ex ante conditionality, all the conditions and this, all this happens. Even now we put conditions on whether the performance is done. Some of these things take time to do. Okay. So my policy will be have very few preconditions. Like this, I mean, you see that there are huge liabilities that you cannot afford, you have to tell them. But then just, uh, just leave the countries to do their own programs. But then just say, well, we're going to do another assessment of your risk assessment down the road. And the terms of the country might change and the risk of performance. That's why I was insisting on having strong fiscal institution at the European level. I mean, we have DSM, but we also have the Commission. But that's, again, th those things should be much more integrated and more powerful. And when I insist, said also you had to have a degree of independence, is because when you do an assessment of the country and you have to decide whether they are going to have more debt or not, that can become extremely political. In the same way that we have given independence to the ECB, because it can become extremely political whether you let inflation go or not. We call time inconsistency. Okay. So those are the kind of things. So I, I will not put the accent certainly of a new stability and growth pact version three. I will minimize that aspect, but I will strengthen the other aspects, the institutional and also the managing of the debt. Because the managing of the debt is not just the one we're going to have out of the next generation. It's also that whatever you do, 
is crucial with respect to the domestic then. And it's not a good design that all, oops, that, that all is on the hands of the ECB so much. Because I think then other complaints are gonna come up with the German court or whoever, that that's not what the ECB is for. So there are things which are purely physical, better let's have a good institution on that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ramon, and thank you, Michel, for asking the question. Any more questions? Vivian, please. Uh, yeah, this is not a question, but I'd just like to add to, to this and to Michelle's question and Ramon's response, which I agree with Ramon. Um, and I think Michelle points out a very important problem that the escape clause is going to be disactivated at some point. What we need to make sure, what the EU needs to be to make sure is that it is not disactivated while the existing rules and numbers are in place because they don't work. They can't for the simple reason that the numbers are too low. You know, debt is supposed to be moving towards 60%. Well, most, country, most countries are at 100% or above. Um, so that, uh, and the problem with the escape clause is that it is all over the place in the treaties. Eric Jones actually has a really good report on this for the European Parliament. And the question is, how do you fix this? Um, and how do you fix this in a context where we already see differences, frugal, frugal four plus um, versus the rest? So these are, these are actually technical issues, but can you use the passerelle clause to remedy someone else who's more of an expert on the legal stuff can say something here, I would hope. But, but how do you, maybe Federico will answer this later, um, but how does one essentially ensure that you change these rules. I mean, my view, and I go along with Olivier Blanchard, formerly of the IMF, et cetera, who says, get rid of these numbers and at least have standards. I've been talking about guidelines for a number of years, but sort of guidelines, but, but leaving aside debt that is really about investment. I think one of the big problems um, in the EU, and this is about order liberal ideas about debt, and it's particularly German view, you know, the, where the word debt means should shame. Um, one shouldn't see in particular in the case of the EU, but also the member states where we're talking about investment. This is not debt, this is investment. And no country has ever managed to cut its way out of growth, out, you know, out of debt. It's mainly through growth. And so I see the um, next generation EU and the change in ideas that Michael Breen talked about as tremendously important because we now have an opportunity to have countries actually grow and invest their way out of debt. This is particularly important, I would argue, and I think Ramon would agree for Italy. But you know, Italy's debt is, is, is an overhang from the past. It's had a primary surplus for years. So the question is, you know, this is, you know, bracket the Italian problem, but all countries, the only way they're going to get out of that debt and flourish is through growth. And that growth has to come from investment. And investment was basically stopped throughout the Eurozone crisis years, not only in Southern Europe, where countries didn't have the so-called fiscal space to invest, but also in Northern Europe, where they had the fiscal space, but they did not invest. So it seems to me that, that one, one, what one needs to do is not only change the rules and the numbers, but also change people's attitudes or understanding. And this is sort of, we need to talk about changing people's ideas. And oh, your one last thing, which is to um, add to what Bart had said, which is where I think he, he, he talked about the dramatic problems in terms of social partners and, 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 and uh, social affairs, et cetera, being cut out of that, about this. Part of the reason I argued for having a kind of macroeconomic dialogue to substitute for what we have now is, is not only to use the amazing semester architecture to create a moment where all member states at, can be together, but also to bring in the social partners and citizens 
to have a sort of a question of what do we do next year um, and how do we do it? But it's also to democ it's sort of decentralize and democratize it. But it should be not only EU level, but also national and local level. You know, these national, this first iteration is gonna be problematic because it's gonna be ministries of finance, perhaps economics, saying these are the things we need to do, which is very top down within the member states. It needs to come much more bottom up. And for that, Bart's absolutely right. You need to bring in the social partners. And I see it at local level, bring in the, the cities and regions as well as the, um, and because that's also, and I'm gonna stop here, that's also a way to help avoid corruption. We're worried about the illiberal democracies, essentially awarding all their friends well, the only way you're going to stop that or at least mitigate against it is by bringing in social partner citizens who can say, wait a minute, that's going to your friends. That's not going to help green the economy. Here's what we need to do. And I'll stop there. Uh, thank you so much, Vivian. But you have another question uh, lined up. I got a message by Ian Cooper, who works on national parliaments, and that's what he wants to ask you about. Ian. Hi. Um Thank you. Uh, thank you for this, the, all these excellent presentations. I guess I'm specifically, um, this question is for Vivian, um, and you mentioned national parliaments briefly, but then uh, you didn't really expand on what you think the role of the national parliaments should be, um, especially in the implementation of the next generation EU um, programs because it seems like it's emerging as uh, mostly a matter of negotiation between national governments and the commission about how these, uh, these uh, proposals are going to go. Um, and if I could recall, just uh, go back in history just a little bit, if you recall the uh, Fiscal Compact Treaty, Fiscal Compact Treaty also included an, an Article 13 which called for the creation of an interparliamentary conference um, to oversee um, the implementation of the Fiscal Compact Treaty. Um, but at that time and uh, in subsequent years, that, that conference was created, but there was not agreement over what was the main purpose of that conference, because some people thought it should actually have a role, an oversight role, with respect to European economic governance and how the EU institutions are implementing the new regime. Whereas some, and some perhaps more on the Northern or sort of German order liberal side, thought that this interparliamentary conference should just be one more layer of surveillance of, of how the uh, rules of the, of the European semester were being implemented. And so if you, so I think some serious thought needs to be put into um, what the role of national parliaments, who after all should have the power of the purse, um, what their role should be in the implementation of this new, um, this new fiscal capacity uh, as it's being put in place. Uh, yeah, I uh, just answered that um, quickly. I mean, you're absolutely right. The interparliamentary conference what has it done so far? Yeah, they've talked a lot. That's important, but it's not enough. I'm not entirely sure what role this they, it could have. Maybe it could be part of the macroeconomic dialogue that I've just invented. Um, but it seems to me that, that there needs to be much, much more discussion of where we're going in the future. It's tremendously important, as others have said, that the commission has really pushed greening the economy um, but it's not enough for just the commission to do it. This needs to be part of general uh, Europe-wide dialogue and discussion. So interparliamentary conference, one needs to invent a role for it. This could be part of that role, thinking about moving to the future. Um, and as part of this macroeconomic dialogue, actually, we need to think about the ECB and its secondary objectives, which you know, primary objective is, is price stability. The secondary ones are employment, but could be greening the economy, et cetera. And it's hesitant to do anything because it's afraid that it would be taking on a political function. There are divisions within um, the ECB uh, governing board. This might also be a role for the macroeconomic dialogue 
and this interparliamentary conference to talk about where do we see the EU going? So it's not just the commission saying this or even certain member state leaders in the council, but that you can actually have a discussion. That seems to me perfect for the inter interparliamentary conference. So thank you for raising this because it never occurred to me that this is actually something for it. And just very quickly um, to finish on national parliaments, I think they need to be, I mean, this is about the redistribution. This is a redistribute function now. Not only should the European Parliament be involved because of it, but the national parliaments. This is key. This is where you don't want sort of technocrats in the Ministry of Economy in charge of industrial policy to say, oh, this is where we need to invest. That's never going to work. Or, or it's, you know, it's problematic. But if you can have the parliaments actually be part of this, as well as, as I mentioned before, social partners, get people involved. This can become a kind of national revival policy. If you think back to um, the 1950s and the French, French plan, the whole planning exercise actually wasn't really very well targeted. It got worse and worse over time, but it had an important function for, get, for getting what de Gaulle called the force vive, um, together in the society to move forward, to think about how do we plan, where are we going, how do we invest for the future? And that was tremendously important for the recovering revival of France. And I see this in some, in some ways as also the way for, um, for the EU. But now with this much stronger role for national parliaments in the formulation stage, as well as in the implementation stage, you know, the parliaments are accountability forums. We need to ensure accountability. But they're also, you know, they also have new ideas. And so formulation, but also implementation. Thank you so much, uh, Vivian, for also coming in on this question. I have Anne Moji who raised her hand. Would you like to pose your question? Hi, yes, thank you. Um, so I have a question with specifically to um, Vivian Smith. So you mentioned the secondary objectives of the ECB, and I think that's a very interesting topic. But when you look at the secondary, uh, from a legal perspective, at the secondary objectives, when they support this, the economy or when they want to introduce uh, policies against climate change or other objectives, the ECB has to comply with a lot of uh, other legislation as well and a lot more accountability should be needed for that. In, in what kind of system would you envisage the ECB uh, in relation to the parliament vis-a-vis -vis accountability and how to ensure its effectiveness? Okay, very briefly on this. Um, essentially, one way to do it was back to my macroeconomic dialogues. That ensures greater accountability, but also to reinforce the link between the ECB and the European Parliament, which is a weak accountability forum. Now it has no sanction possibility, et cetera. But if one could make that much more robust, that would be a way in, you know, sort of that dialogue between the ECB and the European Parliament could be one way to do it. But there's still the problem of, it's not just the legal perspectives, but it's others. It's the ECB is hesitating, not quite knowing where to do it, it needs guidance. And until it gets political guidance, it's not going. So it could be the council as well, but I like the idea of a you know, great macroeconomic dialogue for the ECB to talk about what it should and could do. Uh, you know, employment is one of the areas. Um, it's continuing to do so-called neutral bio, bond buying, which is not neutral because it's still buying from carbon, um, you know, uh, strong um, companies, et cetera. So, um, but for that, it needs guidance. You know, I would love to see it do helicopter money. I know that's never going to happen. Um, but 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 f n all of that requires um, actually political uh, guidance. And for that, there can be different ways of doing it. But that, I think that's the only answer. You're right about the legal issues involved. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vivian, yet again. I would like to see if we have any other questions around the screens. 
Federico wants to ask a question. Anyone else? I have to be very democratic here, but it's difficult <laughs> because I don't see everybody. So if you raise your hand or send me a question in the chat, I can still give you the floor. Well, then Federico, the screen was. Thanks, Christine. And I am, uh, I hope I'm not abusing my role here, but obviously the conversation is, is very interesting. And I was also called in earlier by, by a comment that uh, Vivian made. So uh, I, I just would like to uh, make a quick remark and then ask a, a question to all the panelists. So the quick remark uh, from a legal perspective, building up on something Vivian was saying about sort of getting rid of the debt break at constitutional level in the member state. Uh, well, I think what is more important actually, at least to me as, as a new lawyer, is getting rid of the debt break at EU level. Uh, in uh, the Treaty on the European Union at Article 310, we actually have a balanced budget requirement, uh, which is quite exceptional. So the EU is, in this, is in, in this unique situation where you have a prohibition of running debt and deficit at state level because of the fiscal compact and simultaneously a prohibition to running debt at, at the European level. And that is now becoming a problem with the next generation EU because the own resource decision has to be increased to cover the cost of that 750 billion uh, extra debt that the EU is going to incur. In the United States, you do have uh, debt breaks at state level, but the federal government is able to, uh, 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 to sort of issue debt no limit, as we know very well. Uh, and I think therefore, in terms of, you know, if you wanna pick a legal fight uh, against the debt break, I'd rather go against the, uh, the EU one rather than the, rather than the national one. But, but we, might, we might talk about that. Uh, the question I have for, uh, for everyone in, in the panel uh, is, uh, is instead about the Conference on the Future of Europe. And I wanted to raise it now. We're, we're gonna uh, come back to this later in, in the conference, but uh, given your multidisciplinary expertise and, and your perspective, I'd be interested in knowing uh, what, what your thoughts are. And, and particularly, uh, if I can put the question a bit provocatively, uh, what I would ask is this. I mean, can we expect some radical institutional reforms uh, to back up the radical sort of economic policy reforms uh, that Next Generation EU has brought about. Uh, clearly, the recovery fund is a, is a significant change uh, in the way how economic governance in Europe works. It might be one off. Uh, we still don't know whether it will work out, et cetera, et cetera, but it, it is a change. And I think, you know, Michael's point about the impact of ideas is, uh, is quite, quite right. But uh, do we have the institutions to back that up? I mean, the discussion about the commissions you guys were having earlier on, the legitimacy, I mean, the role of the European Parliament, if we have European taxes, shouldn't we also think about radical institutional and constitutional treaty reforms? I'd be happy to have your thoughts. Thanks. Thank you very much, Federico, for these uh, very provocative uh, questions. Before I give the screens to the panelists to wrap up this panel, I would like to ask if anyone else has a question. I feel a bit like a flight attendant. Otherwise, we are going to take off. Any other questions? Of course, there will be also panels after lunch where we can also still discuss some of the issues uh, in more detail. If there are no questions, then I would Sorry, like... Christine, I see a question by uh, Ernst hirsch Palin that was coming to me, but I guess... Perfect. So please, um, Ernst think... hirsch Palin, please take this, the floor. Well, thank you. Um, uh, it was just a, a comment on the, the discussion that I uh, heard in which, uh, as, uh, as quite often, the national parliaments are um, viewed as a single actor. In reality, they are not at all single actors. So we have, we'll never have an exchange of views between the national parliaments as if it were 27 um, um, individuals meeting each other. They are as much divided within themselves as other parliaments and European parliament, of course. And that is, um, uh, if I may add one observation to what I have written in, my, in the chat, also uh, a problem with the progress that uh, Federico has just rightly um, uh, pleaded for, uh, a difficulty that we'll encounter and will continue to encounter with the divisions about these very views within the national parliaments. 
Thank you so much, Ernst, for this intervention, which I very much share, having worked in national parliaments for a while now. Uh, of course, even within one national parliament, as everyone knows, we have very different views and changing views on different issues. I would now like to give the screens back to the speakers, and I would like to do this um, in the order uh, in which you came in. So that would be Michael taking uh, the floor first, and any general reflections would, of course, also be very welcome in the next 10 minutes that we have as, as a panel as a whole. So Michael, please kick us off. Uh, thank you very much. Um, you asked very important questions. Um, the, the, I mean, the thing that stands out um, to, to your question, Federico, is, is you know, what kind of opportunity does this conference present you know, to make Europe more democratic, to bring in the voices of citizens, and you know, how will that affect EU institutions? And I would see more potential for it to reshape a future iteration of the ORF. Um, and I think the problem with it at the moment is it's, it's primarily directed at fighting a crisis under very specific conditions. Um, but through deeper engagement and dialogue with citizens, there might be creative combinations and solutions that could enable something that is less focused on dealing with an immediate problem and more focused with innovation and development in the future. And that's, I think that's the key issue for European fiscal policy, how to move from one crisis to, from a crisis driven process into a more, a process with longer time horizons. That's why the ORF is, is excellent, bring in a green element, but it's critical to move to longer time horizons, um, such as the issues raised by uh, Raymond Mar uh, Marriman, and regarding the demographic changes in Europe, this is a great opportunity to have longer time horizons through, through engagement. I'm less confident about the ability of citizen engagement to transform an institution like the ECB. I'm, I'm, from the way in which central banks work, I'm not sure how much, you know, there's a significant trade-off in engaging in dialogue um, and you, you, you lose the ability to I think uh, you, you lose a certain amount of economic stability um, it, it, through that process, um, in particular uh, because the you know the ECB has has to really anticipate financial market behavior, um, and that's the problem it faces. And um, so when it engages in deep dialogue, you know this is where um, you know and if it if it if it's if it's to really engage in dialogue, it has to respond to that dialogue with. Um, you know, its own suggestions. And, and, and this is where, you know, it is, it will be trying to anticipate financial market developments. And, and that's, we won't see a satisfactory outcome. Um, thank you, I'll, I'll, I'll pass the floor over to my, my colleagues. Thank you, Ramon. <laughs> Ramon, you're on mute. Yes, yes, yes. Just a couple of things, because I think many interesting things have already been said. One is that uh, it's known historically that after big uh, uh, pandemics, crises uh, that last for long, and this one is now is lasting for long, there's been a period of uh, social crisis and unrest. And we have the numbers that this still might happen. In the same sense that we might have even financial crisis, but we're going to see a lot of business going and under. So just to avoid that, that will be a, a big thing. And that will require a good combination of support programs, so extending this, what we're doing now. And I'll say at the beginning, just making sure that the single market works at its full. And the second, and this goes back to Federico's question, I think that the, the turning point that even the commissioner was mentioning, I see it in one thing, is that uh, the EU, and the EU in particular after Brexit, and after all this crisis, it's much more clear now than ever that this is a long-term partnership. Which means that then, yes, we can have better institutional arrangements than the one we have. Maybe we need not to go into treaty change if possible, but we could and we should. I mean, in fact, for example, the way that IMF 
deals with uh, support is different than the one now that the ESM is doing it. IMF will never give you more than seven years loans. Why now we have it to 33 and longer? That's the right thing to do, but then we can do better. We can just uh, sort of do the loans that maybe in good times, Greece pay more and bad times get more help. So that will bring more resharing. So those things we can be done. But then I think that we think we need to strengthen the institutional arrangement. And there are ways to think of that, even the legal aspects, maybe without the need to change the treaties. But uh, as much uh, we usually we had done big improvements in institutional after crisis, we had a huge one now. I think there is a prime time to have consensus. But it's true, I mean, and I agree with the end, we have to get involved all the partners and something, but it's very important to have institutions that look uh, far ahead as uh, now Michael was saying, and design the policies like that. And that's, and I would say the, the accent now, it's clearly on completing the financial union and all these other things, but also on strengthening this aspect on the fiscal side. That will make much simpler the way that we, whether we need more uh, fiscal rules or whether we can deal with the issue about uh, caps into the debt. Because we need a lot of things when we are, don't have any confidence in our institutions. Uh, and the way to have confidence to have them and let it run and very professionally and so on. And of course, it's very important what was said in the first panel transparency, then you can have a role for independent institutions to really do the surveillance. We have an extremely sophisticated, but also complicated and sometimes cumbersome way of surveillance in the union. But things are transparent, then it's easy just to go to European Parliament or the national parliaments or either independent institutions to say, well, yes, the job is being done properly or not. Thanks. Thank you very much. Vivian, please. Yeah, thank you, Federico, for that question. Um, and the question, radical institutional reforms? I don't know. It seems to me that's very ambitious. And from what I hear and from the people I'm talking to, uh, people are already tremendously disappointed with the way in which the Conference on the Future of um, Europe is set up with three institutional co-chairs or whatever, um, concerned that it's not gonna be ambitious, that it's short because it's only nine months, therefore what can it do? And it looks as if it's not really providing a substantial role for citizens input. So there's disappointment there from all the people who saw this as a really bottom up process. Um, so I'm not exactly sure what to say here because it's so vague still. What is it supposed to do? I keep reading and asking myself, you know, I need to understand, but, but we're, you know, we're at the process stage. What are the kinds of policies it's going to talk about? Um, we don't know. So, you know, everything is possible and nothing is possible. Um, is it going to be a nine month exercise in letting uh, Emmanuel Macron uh, who's head of the, you know, the president's the rotating presidency to be able to say, here we go, I've made this wonderful thing, but, you know, is it going to do nothing? Um, or is it possible that it'll be extended another year and therefore do something and, and, and provide more opening to citizens where it can become a vehicle for ex not simply exchange of new ideas, but, but even ideas about policies. And so in, 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 in response to Ernst Hirschbunin's uh, comment about national parliaments not being single actors, exactly. That's probably why you don't want national governments that are essentially the majority party to be the only ones being heard. And so maybe, maybe again in this conference on the future of Europe, if one brought in national, you know, sort of different views from all sorts of parliaments, uh, national parliaments, that might be a way, but, but you know, who knows? Um, and finally, 
Um, if we're talking policies, if we're talking about institutional change, I really like Ramon's idea um, about a single kind of fiscal authority. Do we call it an EU finance minister or do we call it the sort of the you know, EU treasury now and bring together all the different pots um, in a single place. I don't know, but think that seems to me like a major institutional reform that could also be a move forward in terms of, um, in, in, in terms of actual policies. Uh, but as for changing the treaties, and this is for Federico to answer later, but can we use the passerelle clause to avoid having to go through a treaty change? Um, but you know, beyond that, what I'd love to see and I doubt this will happen, is get, this is the place where one could say the end of the unanimity rule only allows super majorities with perhaps opt-outs. You know, people have been talking about that for years. I think Mario Monti suggested this way back in the 2008-9 um, or wherever, um, for example. But a whole way, number of ways in which one could kind of loosen the rules um, make it possible, more enhanced cooperation, make it possible for member states to go forward. I argue that one needs to think about the EU in terms of a soft core Europe, not deeper integration altogether, but deeper integration through greater differentiation, where different policy communities can, can, can go forward, where, but where you can have opt-outs or opt-ins uh, even from, here's for the UK and, and, and the Brexiteers, opt in on areas like security and defense policy. And for that, you know, for, for non-members or for members that are only partially members, anytime one is part of a particular policy community, one should not simply have voice but vote. So if the UK were to join the security, you know, the new, let's call it the Security Council, of the EU to, to match Ramon's fiscal um, institute, institution, uh, vote as well as voice. So I'll stop here. Thank you so much again for very innovative and inspiring ideas. I would now like to give the floor to Bart and you have raised also the issue of the social partners. I would also be interested in these concluding remarks. How would you like to see them uh, involved very concretely. Okay. Thank you very much, um, especially to Federico for raising this uh, almost impossible to answer a question, but okay, that's that's your role, of course. So I, I, I would agree with uh, Vivian that, well, having, having read uh, some of the text, all of this seems rather vague and I'm not I'm not very optimistic at this stage um, there is the risk is really that it becomes a, a, a lot of lip service um, a lot of lip service and nothing real comes out of it especially of course in view indeed of the timeline which you already referred to we know that involving stakeholders involving citizens involving social partners uh, if you want to take that seriously then you need time and time is, is seems um, uh, especially what 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 is not at hand and so um, Federico maybe to this I will disappoint you with it but I just want to suggest two issue areas where um, the mindset as a result of, of the crisis, of the pandemic crisis, might have changed and might, um, uh, uh, might, be, a pro might be promising areas to, to, to finally and really uh, uh, advance. The first is obviously health. Uh, so it's maybe kicking in an open door, uh, but I think that uh, we've all become aware, also policymakers um, at the EU level, at the national level, who've always been extremely prudent to give any competence to the EU in the field of health, in the field of health care, especially, uh, as a result of which we are still uh, in the situation where we started uh, in the 1950s, at the end of the 1950s, namely that EU health policy is largely made by uh, judges and the market uh, and I hope and I think that uh, the conference uh, might be uh, really the opportunity 
uh, to to crystallize to make make it clear that indeed um, also building on the good performances of you know the European Centre for Disease Prevention the, the and other EU agencies who've really done within their constraints you know legal competences have done a, a good job in coordinating policies in pushing certain uh, policies. Um, uh, so I hope that you know health would be one area where uh, the EU. I mean, should not just stretch its existing competences to the full, which is happening already, but that there uh, may be a next step in granting uh, the EU more competences uh, in this health and uh, putting an end to uh, unanimity, uh, Vivian, would of course one way to go about it. A second uh, point, and it's not an issue area, but it's a very big issue which we don't talk about enough, is gender equality. Uh, I mean, the crisis, uh, and I'm, I'm really puzzled uh, that we haven't even mentioned it yet today, I think, except if I missed something. So uh, COVID-19 had a very clear and uh, obvious gendered impact. Uh, women were, as we all know, they were less, um, less often ill from COVID-19 and they suffered more than men in terms of job loss, in terms of, of course, um, uh, having to combine work and family life. They suffered more since they had uh, much, met many more gaps in their social protection than men did, uh, etc. And what is the EU doing? Uh, I mean, gender equality uh, is, is one of these issues where uh, it's one of the foundational myths of the European Union. It was already there in the Treaty of Rome, etc. And in practice, well, things have been done, to be clear, important things have been done within very limited and constrained uh, legal competencies again, and not enough has been done. And I really sincerely hope, Federico, and I, again, maybe this may be not enough for what you were expecting, but I really hope that if one one additional point uh, comes out of this conference is that the EU should do more than pay lip service to promoting gender equality to mainstreaming which is a very nice idea but which is not uh, delivering any real or uh, serious results uh, as at least in my in my reading so health policies and gender equality I would uh, seriously put them forward as two important topics um, that could be taken forward uh, during this conference thank you thank you so much uh, Bart and now I would like to give I would like to first of all actually thank all the speakers for an excellent discussion wonderful input and also lots of food uh, for thought. And before closing this panel, I would like to give the floor to Federico to um, lead us through um, the rest of the day, some housekeeping issues um, and some practical information. Thank you. <laughs>